Okay. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for the turning up for this, this meeting. Um, so this should be our main meeting. And so with regards to an agenda, we're going to have the typical intro just to kind of again reorient everyone as to what our goals are and what they're trying to accomplish. Um, and then, and then we're going to have a quick little truncated summary of um, the FOP data. I mean, for the benefit of the people who are unable to attend the meeting the day when Eileen gave us that nice one now. You know, I try to create a truncated version so that, you know, people again can get a feel for some of the efficacy data that we have for um, 2009 in the FOP model. Um, and it's also good to just get a second look at such exciting data. So. And then after that, we're going to have Alex give an update and some of the assay efforts on his end. Then we'll get um, an update from Jerome regarding some of the efforts looking at potential combinations of 2009 with other, um, other mechanisms of action. So he's going to give you an early sneak peek at the, the plan and how we're going about doing that. Then so he's going to give us an update on some of the chemistry. Um, some of, I mean, for the, for the Toronto group, I mean, some of the compounds that we have made, they've been shipped off and we don't have any data. So it just never made any sense discussing SAR without SAR data. So we're going to bypass this meeting for um, a Toronto chemistry update. But Sue is going to give us, Sue is going to make up for both of us today. <laughs> um, and then Owen actually is going to give a, an overview of some of the plans that we have in meeting with some of the clinicians to gain some guidance as to how we would want to approach developing an alter inhibitor clinically. And then in the end, there's lots of time for discussion, particularly um, I'm hoping we get into some of the discussions about the DIPG model in vivo. So, okay, so looking forward to some exciting updates. So without further ado, um, with regards to the intro. So what I thought I'll do is go back over some of the actionables from last month as more of a highlight. So one of the things we decided last month, we were eagerly awaiting the data from Eileen. And then we had agreed that she was going to give us an update on the 24th of um, April. And that did happen, that, that exciting update. So that was complete. Um, another actionable that we had to do, number five, was basically give the OICL the city grant progress update. So that was kind of tight, but we managed to finish the report and submit that. So that was complete. Um, one of the things I've decided to do later in this slide deck is, no, we have what? For this grant, we have another couple of months left, and there are some um, deliverables we had promised, so I'm actually going to present them and let people chime in in terms of whether or not they'll be achievable. Okay, so you'll get a chance to see what those are. We had promised those two years ago. Sometimes we make promises for deliverables, good things start happening and then we forget. <laughs> Diminution, the buying new things that we promised. Okay, but on top of those two completed actions, um, there's still some interesting and important stuff to finish up. Um, so again, like, like I mentioned earlier, Jerome is going to talk about some of the combination studies that we are looking at right now. Because everybody knows maybe algs, I mean, DIPD is such a complicated disease. There's probably potential. There's a number of potential drivers for the disease, and so it's good to assess combination strategies. Um, in addition to the FOP model, again, <clears throat> We want to look at some in vivo DIPG models which are under development. We're trying to establish cell lines that are dependent on how to for growth. And if we could get some of those in a graph, that would be ideal. So we'll discuss a bit of that later. But more important, again, for the available patient derived cell lines, I still think it's important to establish which of those cell lines, if any, are driven by an out to mechanism so that we can actually develop models, out to models. And so that might demand some CRISPR type work, maybe some chemical knockdown, or some of the studies we're currently doing, just looking at compounds that are structurally different, that bind to add to what kind of phenotype are we going to get on some of these lines. All right. So 
I'd like to remind people of our lead candidate, which is 2009, which we have in reasonable quantities, and on the right-hand corner is the overall profile. It's a very, very good profile. I mean, the only two lingering aspects with the profile that we keep, you know, thinking a lot about is a tug activity, and as I say, there are different, differing opinions as to whether or not that's a reasonable hug number to advance a compound. Some people probably would prefer to see better herb numbers, but there are ways to do risk herb liability going forward, um, like dog telemetry. I mean, it's an expense. It's about 80 grand or something like that. But um, like as I said, we have another couple of months still in the program. So if we can actually address it, you now is a good time to do it. But, you know, it's not a sure stop. I mean, if we're unable to adjust the herb, we're going to probably have to develop a plan to de-risk it going forward. Um, the other thing with 009, as it applies to mouse, is one of the things we're keeping an eye on is it's, you know, there's some degree of clearance, moderate to high clearance. The half-life in mouse is about two hours, so we might have to do multiple doses to get sustained exposure. So that's another aspect. If we can improve it, it's a big plus. Now you're gonna see some of the backup candidates later on that do have that desired profile in terms of improved clearance in mouse. But overall, I think it's a very, very nice candidate. It features are excellent, and you'll see that going forward. Um, another slide I'd like to present, I was saying about 2009, which is quite attractive, is the fact that you know we can dose 209 in mouse up to 100 mix per kg, and this is the corresponding figure. We see nice linearity with dose escalation, so that gives me comfort that during so just to be clear, we can. Uh, there's no reason that we know yet why we can't go past 100 mix per kg. No, no, we, we just stop at 100. We still we need to. 100. Yeah, we still need to push that further. No, no, we haven't reached an MTD yeah. yet. I mean, there's still room to go, and that would come during probably more routine talk studies. We just wanted to know if we can push it past 100. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, we're a little bit concerned. A lot of the earlier studies with um, the in vivo models with the IPG, with some of the earlier compounds, they only went up to 25 mix per kg, and I guess that was tox limiting. Well, it's comforting to see that we can actually go to higher doses. I think one of the things I also wanted to point out on this slide too, I mean, is later on we're going to talk about the FOP model and, you know, we had dose it at 100 mix per kg and we have samples to look at exposure in the experiment. We don't have them yet, but I think this PK escalation study kind of gives you an idea of what sort of exposures we get at 100 mix per kg, we're seeing almost 11 micromoles, sorry, 11,000 nanograms, which is very, very high. You know, so it gives us sort of a gauge, maybe at 100 mix per kg, these are the kind of doses, you know, that the animal gets exposed to. And so we're bound to get, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that we're bound to get efficacy in the in vivo models with that kind of exposure. So that's actually important to keep in mind. But bottom line, we got nice linearity with dose escalation, very, very attractive, and the animal is tolerated. Um, this was a short, so the previous slide was just PK, dose escalation, that's kind of acute. This is, we did a quick pilot um, tolerability study for five days, just to see if we can dose, you know, 100 mix, 50 mix, and 25 mix for five days without any overt signs of tox. I'm happy to report that in that case, we didn't see any body weight loss. All of the doses were well tolerated. We had a 25 mix twice daily, 100 mix once a day. This gave us the confidence to go into the FOP model with 100 mg per kg dose. And um, we we're quite happy to see that she was able to dose the FOP animals for two weeks at 100 mg per kg and the dose was well tolerated. So, you know, the tolerability of the compound is actually winning us over slowly. It's been quite convincing that compound like this might be well tolerated. And this bodes well for all of the future um, DIPG studies that we're planning to do. Um, for the purpose of backups, you know, I'd also like to highlight this slide where some of the criteria we have in mind for the backup. You have 209, which have an excellent profile on the left side of the table. And I highlighted earlier, it's the herb numbers and the clearance. Those are two issues we are hoping to improve on if we can. Um, now, 217 and 217. One two one one seven and two one four three the two compounds to the bottom. You could see there's some structural differences in them. What we find attractive, you could see is that the half lives are now improved in mouse. We've gone to four and five hours, so they're getting much better. What's also nice to see is that we're getting better selectivity 
against Al five. Okay, so you know, in terms of a backup compound, these are some of the criteria we're having in place where we kind of want to see at least you're either as good as 209 in terms of potency and selectivity. We are hoping to achieve better clearance and better herb numbers. Now, even though we have been able to improve the clearance profile of the two backup compounds highlighted here, you could see the herb is not really adjusted yet. So that's something we still need to keep an eye on, but I'm kind of confident that we'll be able to fix that going forward. Um, so with regards to the grant that we have, which actually the grant finishes in November, but you know M4K still going to exist. I mean the project and the long-term efforts to develop a compound for um, DIPG still continue. So hope that clarifies it. I know some people tend to get confused, like, oh, are we stopping chemistry in November? I mean, if there are things to fix, you know, in under the umbrella of M4K, we can still fix it. But we're going to look for alternative source of funding. Right now, the project was driven by the initiation of that funding from the grant. And our plan is to raise funds and continue the efforts to develop, to deliver, you know, um, a job candidate to these patients who really need it. Um, so. Just to remind people, what were some of the deliverables for the grant that we currently have that's left? I mean, a lot of them were achieved, so kudos to the team. The team has done an excellent job over the past couple of years just to accomplish a lot of the goals. And so these are some of the things that are outstanding. The first one I have here, we told them that we were going to demonstrate compound dependent modulation of a PD marker in vivo. So that's more when we get into in vivo efficacy. We were contemplating looking at like things like phosphosmad and things like that. So maybe as we start thinking of in vivo efficacy, there might be some short-term pilot study we might want to do to look at PD markers. I mean, I've seen people have done terminal studies where you can take a compound, you could dose it, you know, with an animal that has um, the tumor implanted into the brain, and then after a week, you kind of terminate the animal, and you could look at global phosphosmad just to see if there's a decrease after treatment with compounds, so that could probably adjust some of that, but people might have other ideas of what other PD markers you might want to look at that's less terminal. Now, this is something we can only do in animal models, for sure, I mean, but clinically you can terminate people just to see if your compound is working. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, the other deliverable we promise is to evaluate a compound in xenograph survival models. So that's what we're trying to do with some of the DIPG models right now. So a lot of that is starting to come to fruition slowly and get some more discussion of that later. Uh, we had also promised them CNS biomarkers like an ex-vivo phosphorus matter. I mean, we started a little bit of that. I think Jerome has started to look at some of the, you know, I mean, some of these DIPG lines looking at phosphorus matter and ID levels. So we have done some of that, you know, so we are on our way. And then we had also promised them assessing acute toxicity in xenograph models. So that's something we'll be able to measure when we're doing the xeno efficacy. Um, finally, as part of the end game, we told him that we're going to probably have a backup series. Okay, and so we're happy to report. I mean, we do have a lead series and, you know, we have the backup. We have the blueprint scaffold, which is worked on by Sue and her team. And then... What I've decided to do, I feel like base, he said, select a backup to explore based on issues in the lead. So I see her as an issue in the lead, 209, and one way we are trying to address it is that amide on the left-hand side is really addressing the HERG. So I see the amide series as a kind of a backup series to address that issue. So that's the way. So the two lead series I'm calling as backup is the blueprint scaffold and that mesoxy amide series that we're addressing the HERG. So, so those are our backup scaffolds. And we have promised them that we're going to have at least three co-crystal structures from these backup compounds. So we have until November to identify two or three candidates, generate some crystallography. And if you accomplish all of these, we have actually achieved all of our goals for this grant. Okay, so they might give us another two million. <laughs> All right, but I think the team has done an excellent job so far. So we just continue. We have time to deliver these. And um, I think I had shown to the bottom here for the benefit of people who don't know what we mean by the bluefin scaffolds. I mean, these are the two compounds, two representative compounds from the bottom. And then the methoxy amide series I'm talking about, I have it highlighted here in yellow. So those are features that seem to be addressing the herb profile. And so, so those are kind of our two backup series behind 
2009, which is a trimethoxy system. All right, um, any questions? I mean, is any of these goals seems ridiculous and unachievable? If not, if anybody don't have any comments, then continue. Okay, and so on the next slide, what I'm trying to do is keeping track of timelines now in this Gantt chart, kind of again. And so you could see last month we were kind of running the 209 in the FOP model to decide whether or not that was a go or no go. And we were happy to see that we are seeing efficacy. So that was indeed a go. So now you could see that blue line have now moved. We are now in May, early May. We still have the middle of June as we are going to be kind of a hard stop for selection of compound. That doesn't mean you know, we won't continue doing synthesis to improve. But in order to get a compound to fully characterize it to meet the CTIP grant deadline, we pick June, middle of June as a hard stop. Um, okay, so you see we're going to sit down and we're hoping to have about four to five candidates as a short list to kind of pick from to fully characterize. Um, so in light of um, some of the data we have with FOP, one of the nice things with FOP is that it has a mutation which is more causal. So that model, that's one of the reasons why we are so attracted to the model is that it's driven really by that mutation 206. Um, however, in DIPG, it's a little bit more heterogeneous. There's a lot more factors in addition to ALT that contributes to the disease. So it's a little bit more complicated. So, however, that doesn't discourage us from actually demonstrating efficacy in an, um, a DIPG model because it just strengthens our clinical package going forward. It may not be an absolute necessary thing to have, but it actually strengthens your package if you demonstrate some efficacy. And I'm quite confident with the kind of exposures we are getting, we should be able to shrink one of these DIPG tumors in the brain. Um, so, we we're having some discussions <laughs> about you know possible compounds to go in the in vivo model and how long they would take if we decide to put a compound in a DIPG model. And so as a reality check we realized to do a DIPG xenograph we're looking at about what, three months. So we figure out in order to pick a compound, scale it up, do an efficacy study, it's gonna take quite a bit of time. So maybe none of the backup compounds that we're looking at it's probably, it's going to be kind of tight to have scale up and all of that study, you know, to achieve it before the deliverable for the CTIP. So we thought, now since if you have 209 already, large quantities of it, and all we're trying to do is establish a preclinical DIPG model for proof of principle, I think 209 is the ideal candidate for that. And so since if you already have quantities of it, you're starting to think maybe, you know, maybe sometime in early June, I could contemplate that starting to take a sneak peek of an efficacy model for um, 209, and that might run till about September. I think that would also give us time if we identify a second candidate. If you look at the time frame of about four months, we'll probably have to pick a candidate by the end of July and have it scaled up in order to see a second compound in order to meet the timelines close to the deadline for the grant. So what so, would we in, this, in June, if we're going to pick uh, five uh, candidates of the shortlist, we need to start scaling it up, do we not? Well, I mean, we're going to pick candidates, I mean, the other assays, we're going to pick the compounds mm -hmm. based on a short list of assays, but we've got to get things like AIMS, we've got to get that big we got, we got a whole bunch of other things. So that gives us enough time to get all of that data and then see. But at that time, wouldn't it make more sense to do the scale up in parallel? Oh, I mean the scale up all the compounds? The ones that we, we, we picked, picked as a follow So at risk? Yeah, but maybe I mean, we could do I that. Mean, just to, to, to fit everything, first off, I completely get the point of doing things in series. It's more cost effective. It's more yep. But we now actually, we're getting to the point where we have a fairly defined uh, timeline and a fairly defined amount of cash that we have left yes. over. Yes. So I think to the extent that we can do things in parallel here, yep. it, it will make sense. Completely get, early on we have to do things in series because we don't know okay. what we're going to get crammed on. But I think now we can, you know, we're not going to get a reward for having cash left over at the end. I know, yes, so yes. We'll so that, that was kind of a... You know, oh. and, and just for people on the line, this is, you know, I think we're having this conversation next week scheduled yeah. Yeah. to go through on this. Yeah. But, you know, just from a heads up for people, I, I'm of the view that 
come June when we say, look, this is pretty much where we're going to go forward with these ones. Yeah. Let's start scaling them up. Yeah. Let's start doing things in parallel. If they drop out and we've got extra compound, so be it. We had to give it a try. I'm for that. I mean, as long as the cash is there. Yeah. 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 We'll so have that's a okay. Conversation next week internally. Okay. Yep, so that's our plan. So we'll, whatever we candidates we, we settle on in the interim, we're probably going to scale them and, you know, probably look at some of these. So, and you could see downstream, we're thinking probably minimum, you might want to do a little bit of rat tolerability, you know, rat toxicity, some PK, some rat PK. And then the question about dark telemetry for her, we felt like that's something that should be out. I mean, it's not something we promised to deliver in the grant because it's a very costly venture. But again, if a lot of cash is left over, and you want dark telemetry on 209. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, it wasn't one of the deliverables. But as I say, if we end up in the event pushing 209 as a compound, like some people are saying, why don't we just push them all in parallel, 209 and whatever other backup candidates? Yeah. <laughs> So, so it's just something to think about. But anyway, this is kind of a, just a rough draft of a timeline that little remembers. I mean, if people have other ideas of stuff and things that we should do during that time frame, don't hesitate to let the team know. All right? Okay, and so that's it kind of for the introduction. I mean, any other questions? I mean, suggestions? I mean, ideas of things that we are doing very wrong and we should be doing very well. Right. I, I think that yeah, the the IPG model, if we get something good going, it's going to be important. I, I foresee that probably the clinician advisory panel will say that as well. Yes. I, I, I yes. Would, I would think so, but I'm just curious. I don't want to presuppose yeah, that we'll, we'll it comes from from a You know, I, I look at all these. And this is not in any shape and form, in my view, is a, like a real preclinical fully robot. This is to help us, this is a tool, in my view, yeah, to absolutely. everyone to select. Mm -hmm. what we're trying to get is, you know, take, you know, there's a lot of questions around the DIPG model and animals, you know, how effective it is, et cetera. But it's a piece of data that could help us decide mm -hmm. which of our candidates go forward mm -hmm. later on. You know, um, I've said this many times before, I, I'm really impressed that 2009 is, is holding up as well as it has. I've never been in a project where, you know, the first compound, so I'm always waiting for that compound to fall off the bandwagon for some yeah. reason. So I would really like to see, and I think there are some other interesting compounds yes. that are already up there yes. mm -hmm. and could hold their own. And to the extent we can advance a solid three to five compounds at the end of this program, yeah. Also makes it, in my guess, more financeable going forward. Yes. So, not to diminish the DIPG animal model, yeah, that's your point, but it will, at the end of the day, I'm expecting very great results. I'm a pessimist. Mm -hmm. But maybe if we see this is a darker shade of gray or a lighter shade of gray, that with that, with the in vitro line, with that, with the other assays we've done, it'll help us make a decision about which ones we go for. Mm -hmm. So, it's a, it's a, hopefully it'll be a good tool. Plus, if we can advance the science around animal modeling, that'd be fantastic. Well, yeah. for the series, I mean. Now, I think I'm, I'm encouraged with the fact that, as I say, of all of these patient derived cell lines, I mean, one of the efforts is to identify which of those cell lines truly has a, an alto dependence. I mean, they can all be various forms. And I think we're kind of getting to which cell lines are likely to give us a hint of some alto dependence. And if we dose, if we can actually dose high, like 209, and get those kind of exposures, just based on the individual numbers for some of these compounds and alto, for the kind of exposures that we might be able to get at those high dose. I don't see why we shouldn't be getting efficacy in the DIPG model that we picked. I mean, and O7 looks promising as a cell line to go forward with. All right, but, but good point. I mean, I think we'll get there. <laughs> I think we'll end up getting efficacy in a DIPG model just to a piece, you know. The skeptics about the models. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the genetics right there. Um, yeah. Someone has a comment. I think I heard. Hi. Yes, it's Sue Cramp here. Hi. Um, I was just wondering. Uh, you talked about the Herg, and we talked. I, I sent you some information uh, last month about possible ways of uh, looking at um, how you might de-risk Herg. Uh, you know, in vitro. Have you had any chance to look at any of that at all? Yeah, we looked at some of it. I mean, we kind of figure out, I mean, for the patch clamp is a good in vitro. The key question is how much more of the in vitro do we go for, or we just go for the jugular? If we have a compound that we like, 
right away just to dog telemetry. Because even if it has no reliability and we continue to do in vitro models, we still have to probably do some in vivo, you know, yeah, study the, the issue, to kind of do with uh, that. So the issue is that with HERG, it, it's not just about HERG activity. It's about and the, uh, the other channels, channels. potential facilitators, and the other channels can um, actually compensate for HERG activity if you if you do get activity in some of the other ion channels. And yeah. I've, I've seen pro programs where you have quite bad HERG inhibition, but because you've got the other ion channels, they're not an issue, and yeah. it's de-risking it at an earlier stage. And it's only in vitro, so it doesn't cost anywhere near as much. I mean, so yeah, I mean, yeah, we we we've had discussions like like compounds like verapamil and those guys which are in the yeah. clinic. They're very potent at her, but they actually hit other calcium channels that are offset. So we are aware of some of that. I think it's an excellent point. I'm just going to say, uh, could you actually get to the point by collecting that either ion channel data that you could definitively say this compound is less likely to have an, an issue than that other compound? Yeah. I mean, yeah. based on the profile. I mean, if you if you can get that data, it seems like pretty reasonable. I mean, and and you could make that decision. Okay. Why not? That is the idea of doing the uh, the more extensive ion channel screening on compounds, so that you can mm -hmm. actually say this is de-risked. Okay, so that's something we could. So what we could do is, if we get candidates that looks promising with HERG, okay, that's good. If we don't get candidates that actually have solved the HERG issue. And all of let's say three or four of the five candidates that we have in our short list, I agree. Then we should look at some of those experiments to see if we can yeah, I think we, prioritize I, I think them. Was, uh, I mean, if it starts to help our answer about this one, I mean, as I said before, this is uh, this is our first Tox flag, and I'm sure we're going to have others. Mm -hmm. And you know, the you know, if we can pick ones with the fewest Tox early on, then whatever crops up later is one less thing we have to deal with. This sounds I'd like to explore this more and maybe mm -hmm. a, a, a quick, more uh, financially reasonable way of, of evaluating this mm -hmm. and doing the comparison than doing a full talk. A dog, a dog, dog yeah. telemetry? Yeah, the only way that but another reason I was inclined to agree was just because those other two compounds look really promising. Yeah, yeah. I think and they also have very similar herd profile. Oh, so yeah. this paradigm would kind of like be a, a reasonable way to compare all three of those compounds. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. Would you like me to uh, investigate and, and get in touch with our guys um, who can provide perhaps a bit more information on that? Yes, please. Yeah, that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then we'll set up a call. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, any other question? If not, up next is Alex. Alex, you online? Hi, Matt, Finn, yeah. Okay. Hi, good morning. How are you? Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> so this one's been somewhat quiet in the junk food. has been back to Singapore to see family. Okay. Um, and our crystallographer had finished and moved to another group. Um, but I'll present a little thing that, um, just a couple of slides that um, catch a little bit of what we were doing. Um, can you start on the previous slide, Methin? Yeah, I'm trying to get this enable editing off. And my, my mouse is acting up. Where's my mouse? Oh, it's going to go down. Pull it down. Huh? Sometimes it just goes really slow. Maybe you just need to click the enable editing. There you go. Top. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. But my mouse is acting up. Oh, oh there. Where is it? Where is it? I think it's up top. Bring it down a little more. Oh. <laughs> what is this? Well, wait, oh, I saw it. Just go to this back uh, of the oh. Hey? Yeah, is it that's it? Yeah, is that it? Click it. No, there, you go. Go. there you go. Nice. Wow, that had no searching. <laughs> okay. Previous slide. Previously, yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. <clears throat> so this was the profile of 2009. Yep. And I noted that one of the um, off targets was the kinase we've worked on here before SCC, TNIC. 
uh, with an IC50 of 96 nanomolar. In itself, that's not a problem in terms of stop no-go, um, but just to sort of note on the next slide, that actually TNIC is antagonistic to the pathway that ALK2 activates, um, or rather the, the functions of ALK2 and TNIC on this pathway are opposite. And so to some extent, inhibiting TNIC is pushing against the direction we want to go in. Um, the ALK2 inhibitor effect would always be dominant. Um, so what happens is TNIC phosphorylates uh, acts as a natural inhibitor, it phosphorylates SMAD in a place that means it no longer binds the ALK2 kinase. And so TNIC is a natural helper, if you like, in terms of the M4K goals. And so inhibiting TNIC um, is somewhat counterproductive, if not uh, no, a sort of a, a big, big problem. Um, so we had a look how many of our M4K compounds actually interfere with TNIC. So that's on the next slide. So we did a thermal shift assay. This, ass this is not quite finished, so the set we've done here didn't include 2009, which is a little annoying, but that will come very, very soon and we'll forward that on. Um, but what's interesting okay. from this is the... Yeah? No, no, go ahead. No, it was funny, we were laughing that it's funny. You know, we did all of that and we didn't do the lead. <laughs> no. okay. okay. So the size of the bars here obviously reflect the potency of the compound binding to the TNIC kinase, this off-target kinase. And what you, anything over four degrees, we might pay attention to. That might be sub one micromolar um, as a ball, rough ball sort of rule of thumb. Um, but what's interesting is virtually nothing actually inhibits TNIC. There's only one or two compounds that inhibit TNIC. So what we'll do is we'll complete this data and we'll just look at the SAR and see if there are any lessons as to any particular compound scaffold parts that correlate with uh, the TNIC activity. Um, What's well, nice, I look, at, I look at the data set. So even the 209 is not in the list? The two back no, of compounds? The, 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 hello? Yeah, the, T, the 2009 wasn't on this screening plate. Yeah, but what I was saying is the two backup compounds that we're looking at, 2117 and 2143, are in the list. And, oh, they're, not active, and they're not active. So 2143 is, is here. Oops, if I can. Here's 2143. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's correct. Okay, so it's less than four. And the other one is 2117. Yep. So both of them were in the list and they were not active. So that was good yeah. to see. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, 2009 would be a, big, a good positive control that the assay is picking up what the kinome profile suggested. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll have that data for you shortly. Okay. Thank you. Good, good stuff. Um. Um, and then Zhang Fu will be back to service from Friday this week. I think he's flying back tomorrow. Um, but while the last few days, just before he left, he was trying again to look at whether the nanobrite assay can be extended to other ALK family members. Um, next slide. I just asked him to replot some of these to make it a bit clearer to see. So he'd actually got quite good success with a number of the ALKs, um, even ALK5, which is in the bottom row middle. Um, there was a small window, the two top curves of the pair to look at. They would have a gap of about 1.8 fold in terms of the signal versus the uh, no inhibitor control. Um, and the other ones were all improvements on that. And he used that as a test on the next slide. Oh, sorry, it's two slides. So this, this is some of the receptors that didn't work with any of the probes. Um, we can uh, do those by other means like the luciferase. Next slide. So trying the nanobret versus our luciferase assay with the ALK5 inhibition. Um, 
the nanobreath signal to noise, which is the top row, you can see is clearly not as good as the luciferase assay, which is the bottom row, but it did give the same rank order in terms of the compounds. Um, there would be a lot more uh, noise in the top row, um, but I think um, it's reassuring that the two assays at least have a, a rank order agreement. Um, so disappointing that we don't have a superb nanobreath out five, um, but we're doing the best we can with the luciferase assay. I think that's the last slide from me, and we'll have okay. more data for you next time. All right, thank you. Any questions for Alex? This is good. this is interesting. It's important to get our selectivity profiles really nailed down, mm -hmm. sorted out. Okay. So we're going to. Who's next up, Joe? So we got Joe slide. Okay. I mean, who should I? I'm actually, so Joe actually is going to talk about some of the efforts for the combo. I actually do have a slide with all of the compounds that you're screening, so I don't know if sure, go ahead. Yeah. I could probably do that as a preface like for people to kind of appreciate it a little bit more. I mean, okay, so I mean, so Jerome is going to actually talk about some of the efforts we have going on looking at combo. So now everybody is away. I mean, and again, the whole concept of combination is just continues to be further emphasized in DIPD that there are just so many other genetic lesions in addition to the histone mutations and all to that. Maybe combination is probably might be the most efficacious way forward. And so, you know, it's important that we actually explore some of that. Um, and so we, we decided we look at alpha inhibition, which is, you know, one of the driving events initially in the disease, but other aberrations might take over. And so the strategy we decided to do is look at 209 in a number of lines. In the beginning, we thought we we're just going to look at 007 and 36, just to keep the workload reasonable, but you know, Jerome is bold and decided to just go for the jugular, so he did a whole bunch of lines. He did almost five lines, so kudos to Jerome for actually taking on the humongous task. But one of the things we do, we started looking at some of the clinical efforts in DIPG, what sort of compounds and what mechanism of action people are looking at. And what I've tried to do, I've been them into two basic class, there's an epigenetic class of targets, and then there's a kinase class of targets. So we know, you know, there's alpha mutations, there's histone mutations, and then everybody knows that PDGF amplification, PDGF alpha amplification also plays a role. So it's rational to see combinations of epigenetic mechanisms with some kinase mechanisms might be a way forward. So what we decided to do is look at some epigenetic targets that might impact some of the histone mutation phenotype. So we looked at easy H2 inhibitors. Now the problem is a lot of the easy H2 inhibitors in the clinic, they're poorly brain penetrant. None of them are really good penetrating compounds. However, one of the strategies we decided, well, an important component of that PRC to complex with easy H2 is E. So you could hopefully accomplish the same inhibition of the complex with an aid inhibitor, those tend to be a lot more CNS penetrant. So we thought if we evaluate um, an easy H2 enzyme inhibitor or look at one of the E compounds, hopefully we'll get a good sense of whether or not this epigenetic strategy is actually going to help. Um, one of the earlier findings from groups like Javit, they found that H DAC inhibitors like panobenostat actually kills a lot of these hormones. Right? Panobenostat is very toxic. The problem is it's not very CNS penetrant. So in the clinic, they're using this convection ablation therapy, which is very, very harsh. They, they work to the blood brain barrier, the kids, just to get the compound across. Of course. And so it's, it's, you know, it's a very harsh method to actually get efficacy. However, there is a, a CNS penetrant H DAC inhibitor, which we got our hands on called compound 26, and we're going to see the numbers in Jerome's update. So those were the three kind of epigenetic strategies we started out thinking of, and then more recently, I added um, two compounds from um, a target called BMI, 
which is part of the PRC1 complex that seems to be implicated in um, a lot of glioblastoma. So it's not on this list, but it's actually a compound that got added. So the ED inhibitors, none of those are, they're obviously not registered. They don't have any, what's the status of those inhibitors in the clinic? Yeah, so MAR683 is the only one that's in the clinic. Okay. Okay, and it's in phase one. Okay, it's in phase one for diseases like um, lymphomas and stuff. Um, same thing for the easiest to enzyme inhibitors. Tazometostat, this is the one that's in the clinic here, 6438. So both of those are going to see data on those, you know, uh, study. Okay, so those are the two clinical ones, but these are some other ones. We thought if we add to the clinical ones other compounds and we get the same data set, then it just bolsters our proof of principle. Um, okay, so and so in addition to these epigenetic targets, keep in mind we added two BMI1 inhibitors, which is part of the PLC1 complex. And then for the kinase target, we had PDGF alpha, so the quinolinib that has been in the clinic for some time, um, for like going after the psychic biology. And then more recently, Blueprint has a nice um, selective PDGF alpha inhibitor. That's much more selective than quinolinib. It's actually more promising. So we'll see some data. Um, we decided to also look at the pan-AKT inhibitor called it's a Roche compound, 006E. This was actually, Angel had mentioned that he was studying this compound for the company and that we should add it to our mix, so we did. So. Um, then there's the PI3 kinase emptor compound, 084. That's um, one of the PI3 kinase inhibitors that CNS penetrant. A lot of them are. This is one that CNS penetrant, and it's also being explored in glioma. It's a Roche compound that went into the clinic. It was actually acquired by a company called Kaiser that's really interested in the glioma space. So they're looking at DIPG and other gliomas in the brain. They just had some nice safety data reported yesterday for it. That's looking good. And that's a phase one trial? It's a phase one, yeah. Wait, they're doing a phase one dose escalation. So, so you could look that up. So Kaiser, the company is called Kaiser. They're really looking at glioma and DIPG. So if it's a combination with this, with our output, that would also be huge. Um, ALK5 is our counter target, so I thought I'll just try a compound to see if an ALK5 inhibitor have any efficacy. And then, because of space, I mean, it's a big experiment, there's a number of cell cycle inhibitors, kinase inhibitors, the CD4, CDK4, CDK6, we talked about the AWO, we talked about we what those are all mechanisms. We didn't look at any of those in the first round, because uh, cell cycle inhibitors, they're going to kill, there's no question. So we might come back and look at the second round of the cell cycle inhibitors in combination with PID. But as a start, we start, we'll look at some of the epigenetic targets and some of the current, you know, other kinase targets in the clinic. And so just for the purpose of people who have an, um, you know, who like to see structures, I mean, I love to see structures, so I have to you know, try <laughs> So to get an appreciation of what the compounds look like. So here's 209. But then for the kinase compound, so GDC084, which is CNS penetrant, this is the compound from a um, Roche that was licensed to this Kaiser com company, CNS penetrant. Here is a pan AKT inhibitor. Okay, so that's the structure of it. There is no data about the CNS penetration profile for this, so that's still a piece of data that's missing. So that's taken into the brain. Um, the L5 inhibitor from Lily is that compound. Quinolinib is this compound, which is a PDGF alpha. That has been in the clinic in phase two for another indication. But it's not as selective as the blueprint compound. It's actually this. It's a lot more kinase. It's a very dirty kinase. But it is, it's PDGF alpha. But the blueprint compound is very clean. Um, but we still need to get CNS penetration data for the, for the blueprint compound. All right, so just so people get an appreciation for the, those are the kinases. These are now the structures for the epigenetic compound. So here you have the easy to compound, which is in phase two, called tazometostat, first compound here. The second one is the E compound from Novartis, also in phase two. That's the structure of it. Now the two other E inhibitors, they're preclinical tool compounds. None of these have advanced to the clinic, but that's what the structures look like. Yes, yeah, so we have them in the assays too. Panabinos that everybody knows. Okay, this doesn't get into the brain very well. And then this is a CNS penetrant APDAC inhibitor. So if that actually synergizes this also, then these are the types of CNS penetrant compounds 
you might want. And then the BMI tag that I mentioned earlier, these are the two compounds that you can actually purchase for proof of principle. However, the, comp the company called PTC actually have a clinical candidate, you can see it out. It's called 596 is actually the candidate in the clinic. And they're also looking at some gliomas and stuff. So, but that structure is unknown. It's not disclosed and it's in phase one. So, but we can hopefully use these two preclinical tools as sort of proof of principle. Okay, so people get an appreciation for the compounds we're thinking of combo. So now, now this is, now we're gonna get the real data from Gerald. <laughs> So this is all it is. Jim, take it over. Yeah, thanks. So um, what we did speak, here. Speak into the mic, Max. Yeah. Yeah. We just took a, a five cell lines. Uh, uh, everybody uh, is probably familiar with them at this point. Uh, uh, the four, seven, twenty-one, and, and uh, oh, I call this XUD FPG seven. I'm sorry about that. This is the the line from Spain, so it's it, it's. It's uh, HSDJ, not uh, Stanford University line. Um, I'll correct that. So they're all ACVR1 mutants except the DIPG6. Um, and we, we tested these, like about 15 different compounds, and for k 2009 is to the left. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the DIPG4 uh, data are all over the place for reasons we don't really understand at this point. So uh, disregard that one, I would say. The IPG6 because it's ACVR1 wild type was intended to be a little bit of our negative control. It's also a cell line that grows much slower uh, than the other. It has a different growth pattern as well. It makes very tight neurospheres. Um, so it might, might not be the ideal negative control actually. Or, or I, I don't even know if it's really a negative control because some of the compound might hit it anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, we see, for example, M4K 2009 doesn't do anything in that cell line as we saw in other assays. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'd just be cautious in interpreting these data. But we got pretty good data from uh, uh, the, the 007 line as well as the 21 and 36. Um, and I pointed those that caught our eye more so so that we're gonna, we kind of want to give it a try in combination with 2009. So mm -hmm. PI Pritan is inhibitor, uh, BMI1. Um, so this, both of the BMI1 inhibitor actually worked really nicely. I, I'm thinking we should pick the one that works a little bit less well oh, yeah. actually it's a super for combination because the other one is so potent, potent yeah. uh, that it's gonna be really hard to find a window to look at synergy. Mm -hmm. Um, one H tech inhibitor as well, uh, AKT, the AKT inhibitor or, or the PI3 kinase mTOR double inhibitor. The, the, this PI3 kinase mTOR double uh, inhibitor is a uh, it's been clinical trial for glioblastoma now, currently yes. I think, yes. oh, and or for brain brain metastases and other cancers. Yes, yes. So um, that's that's an interesting one, and then the blueprint compound uh, for the PDGFRA uh, also. Um, so we're going to uh, test like a 12 by 12 combination uh, treatment for um, these uh, M4K 2009 and uh, four or five of these, like the ones I indicated with the arrows, uh, maybe starting with the DIPG 007 and DIPG 36 line, mm -hmm. because these ones are, are can be you know, grafted, so uh, maybe it's, it's yeah. a good yeah. start. Yeah, just to highlight, just to mention again, so the, you know, we were, we were hoping that a lot of the easy H2 inhibitor, which would probably, you know, take care of some of that histone mutations based on some of the earlier hypotheses. None of the easy H2 inhibitors are doing anything to the cell line. So, yeah, the E then is the H2. The E then is the E then H2 aren't doing much. So, I mean, we're going to do the combo 209 with some of those ones that we're already seeing are hint of activity. Maybe on a second row, maybe just, we might pick the two clinical E inhibitor. Maybe maybe they do nothing by themselves. Maybe we're gonna combine them. So 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 yeah yeah. So we'll we'll probably do that in a second phase mm -hmm. where we combine at least yeah. two or nine with the easy H two in the clinic and the E inhibitor. Well, the first part we want to get a hint of activity and then see if we can potentiate that with two or nine. So we have picked those you know four and we're running full grids like Joe mentioned. I mean. We're going to do full dose response of 209 against a full dose response of all of the others. Yeah. 
So this is exciting. I mean, any hint of potentiation that we see is going to be huge. Any hint of synergism is actually a nice rationale for going forward with two on that. Because, you know, one of the things I think we can take for granted is there's not a lot of CNS penetrant out to compound. A lot of them don't penetrate the brain. I mean, that's a, that's a huge, but the fact that we have compounds that penetrate the brain is huge. And so if you could find other mechanisms that also penetrate the brain, and we can do combination studies, I think that's going to be a win. I should also just mention briefly that the M4K29 profile in this particular assay is a bit less Weak. It's weak. Good. Yeah, it's a bit weaker than what I saw when we did the assay in 96 well. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, this is a different assay system. It's mm -hmm. a 384 well plays, uh, you know, different facility yeah. <laughs> at the same cell. It's also only one data point per yeah. dose, right? So yeah, some of these curves can, you know, it fits, but yeah. it's a bit hard to see. The, mm -hmm. So um, it's just kind of like a point of interest, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions for Jerome? Um, this is Al. Sorry, I was sort of zoned out there. This assay will pick up if the compounds cause differentiation of these cells, will it? Um, it might indirectly if uh, uh, inducing differentiation um, uh, some, somehow affects proliferation. Yes. Or yes. like survival. Yes, it will. Um, so it could indirectly uh, reveal that, but we don't know essentially what's the mechanism <laughs> that causes yeah. this inhibition of activity. It could, I mean, this is a metabolic assay, right? It could mm -hmm. just inhibit metabolism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just, just, so. just um, you know, these tumors are developmental tumors as opposed to, yeah. and so it's not, a, it may not be unexpected that that's what we get as we turn these things into astrocytes or whatever the hell they would be. Okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Good. Okay, no other questions for Daryl. So, yes, yeah, so we'll stay tuned for the combo. I mean, I'm looking forward to some synergy studies at 209. Okay, uh, so up next is Sue. Let me think for running um, all these uh, the uh, synergy studies. I was actually playing them today, and yeah. we'll have the first synergy data uh, next week. Yeah. For two cell lines and four compounds. Uh, yes. So. Okay, good. Yeah. That's good. Okay. All right, Sue, so you're up. Yep. Hi there. Okay, next slide, please. <laughs> so, just a general update, as usual, on what activities we've been doing. Uh, so, we held a webinar last week, last, yeah, last week, on Tuesday the 30th. Um, the content was similar to the talk I gave on at the AACR um, and we had a, several interesting questions came up at the end of that so more exposure um, of, about the project so we've had you might remember last September we had a global day of service um, so we held another one uh, last month um, we had about 50 people this time participating in it um, a number of chemists uh, trying to make some more new compounds for us and some again as before we had a number of our uh, non-chemist biologists and and others um, who went into the lab to learn a bit about chemistry um, so once again that was really successful um, and um, yeah it, it people enjoy doing this Okay. And very productive towards the <laughs> towards the project. Um, so, so this month we've uh, there were five new compounds sent for screening. That should be in April. Sorry, uh, um, they're all they were all within the blueprint series. Uh, so we're aiming at trying to understand whether improved brain penetration can be achieved within this series, and that's the reason I've asked on a, a couple of. Uh, whether we can have the CACO2 data so that we can understand whether we're making any progress in terms of permeability on these compounds. Mm -hmm. And we're continuing to make some new, more new compounds around the blueprint area, but we really do need that information so that we can uh, assess whether we're uh, reducing the level of uh, efflux that we saw with uh, M4K3007. 
Yeah. So yeah, we'll get some of that. We'll get some of that data to you. Yeah. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, so we've also been making uh, a few more compounds of uh, progressing with the synthesis of some more compounds within the benzimidazoles, uh, where we've replaced the trimethoxyphenol by the benzimidazole. So some of those compounds have looked interesting. So if you go on to the next slide, please. So just as a reminder, some of these are two of the more interesting benzimidazole compounds. Um, so when we first made M4K3077, it was made by an alkylation at the final alkylation of the benzimidazole at a, at a late stage. And uh, we've now uh, devised a route to specifically make this isomer so that we avoid the uh, ne necessity of the separation of the two isomers. Um, and that will allow us to get some additional ADME data because at the moment that you don't have a sample of that compound to look at the permeability. Mm -hmm. um, so we're also looking at some further analogs, um, such as the making the nitrile trial analog of 3077 and also uh, putting the N-alkylation on there so that again, hoping to use the uh, permeability. Mm -hmm. And then we're also going to look at whether there's any modifications we can make to the paparazine tail uh, to um, increase the permeability of these compounds. Because I think one of the very early benzimidazoles had relatively poor cell permeability. So um, that's one of the, the things that we want to try and address with this series. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so the next slide, please. Um, so this is just a reminder that the main focus of our efforts has been looking at uh, following up on the good activity and selectivity that we see with M4K3007, um, but this compound has, as shown in on the slide, has poor permeability and uh, some efflux, and that was uh, confirmed when we did the PK study with the poor brain uh, brain penetration. So basically, the aim of the making the new compounds is to uh, reduce the molecular weight where possible um, and reduce the um, PKA of the more basic centers. Uh, the two highlighted nitrogens have the potential to, to contribute to the uh, poor uh, CNS penetration. So the current pl plans are aimed at improving the physchem properties while maintaining obviously the good potency and selectivity. And we uh, evaluate all the new targets uh, prior to synthesis by looking at their MPO scores, which involves a combination of log P, PKA, PKA TPSA, molecular weight, etc. And we try and get, um, ideally we want to go greater than five. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I was just saying, I think just recently, I think the patent from Blueprint on this series came out. Um, so David Tink had forwarded it to us. And it looks like they were getting, I mean, according to the patent, they got some potent compounds just with simply the pyridyl and then a pipirazine with just a little carbamate. So the molecules were much smaller, like they were about 10 nanomolar according to the assay. So you might want to look at some of that, sir, and there might be smaller compounds. You may not need the pipirazine on the other side. Um, that pipiridine okay. system, it looks like the pipiridine that's attached to the pyridine. Yeah. Apparently, they had compounds which are a simple pyridyl off of the core. They didn't have yeah. that isopropyl. Yeah. yeah, and they claimed one of the best compounds was about 10 nanomol at alto, and then it was just a simple I think it was a methyl carbamate on the pipirazine. So it was a much smaller molecule as potent. So maybe those might have better CNS penetration. But you might want to go through. I think, I don't know if you've seen it, but we'll send you the pattern. It just came out about a week ago. Yep. And so you can probably start making some smaller versions of those that might still be as good and more permeable. Yep. Okay. We'll do. So can you go to the next slide, please? So our first objective was to try and um, get rid of the ethoxyperidine, as you're suggesting, but we we put in a piperazine, um, mm -hmm. and that we know has been tolerated in some, some of the initial compounds that we've made. 
So we're looking to also, so that reduces the pKa of that uh, nitrogen. So we can also look at uh, some other modifications around there. Uh, on the top, we've uh, we've made the compound top left with a piperidine there. Obviously, it's an acyl piperidine, so it's non-basic. So changing from an N-link to a C-link um, mm -hmm. takes up that uh, the strength, the strong basic center there. Mm -hmm. um, on the bottom row, substitution on the core uh, can uh, improve the uh, reduced pKa of the nitrogen in that position. And we're also looking at some of the modified cores uh, that are not covered within the, the blueprint uh, pattern that we've seen. Um, mm -hmm. So the, these are actually synthesis of some of these as have been initiated over the last few weeks. And uh, well, hopefully we will uh, progress with some of these. Okay. We go on to the new, next slide, please. This is the last slide. So, um, so we're also been looking at what other modifications we might be able to make. Um, and based on what you're you're saying there, there may be some other things that we can consider. But so the first one, looking at uh, on the left hand side, replacing the pyridine with a pyrrolidine and then attaching through an amide. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see the docking pose there, which uh, has quite a good overlay with the the, um, the docked version of the um, of 3007. The other two have been overlaid with the co-crystallized uh, 3007. There's not a huge amount of difference between the crystal, crystal structure and the original docking mode. Um, it's just one was an older version. So on the right hand side, we've looked at compounds, for example, where you put an oxygen link between the uh, core and the top group, uh, the lysine, the group that interacts with the lysine. And with the prolidine there, you can get quite a good uh, interaction with the lysine. And on the bottom, another, um, another idea that we've had uh, was to have a, again a, a C-linked analog as we had in the pre on the previous slide, um, but to have a nitrile on there, which then interacts with the uh, the lysine, and the carbonyl then uh, gives an additional interaction on the other side. Uh, so these these are in the ideas phase, and we're just looking into synthetic tractability. But just to show you that we've got quite a number of ideas to uh, approach. And all of these have MPO scores greater than 4.5. Most are greater than 5. So that they have the a high potential of being brain penetrant. It's not a guarantee, obviously. Never a guarantee. Um, but we, we're using that as a, as a filter as well. Okay. Fantastic. All of them today. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's it. Okay, thanks, Sue. Any questions for Sue? If not, I'll carry on to the next action level, which is, I think, was Owen. Oh, okay. Owen. Yeah, so just a, a quick update for, for, for information for people on the line, et cetera. So we're holding a clinical advisory, two clinical advisory board meetings on Wednesday, May 22nd, and on uh, Friday, May 31st. People are welcome to join. It's going to be uh, here. Um, basically, we want to uh, lay out the program, where it is, and how we see some of these compounds, especially 2009, some of the other compounds being used in the clinic, to get uh, the clinicians' feedback, uh, explore different ideas, and to help in our get their feedback as we consider the select the selection of compounds moving forward. So these meetings are scheduled for uh, later this month, and we're, they will not be live broadcast uh, to the greater world because of we don't have uh, everyone's permission to to do so, uh, and we want to get their confidential um, opinions. But we will uh, report back the overview of everyone's feedback uh, at the June currently. I think it's the sixth meeting. Yes. So we go from there. Okay. All right. All right. That's good. Okay. Um, so the last thing I ended up switching. Um, so like I said, for the benefit of 
people who never got a chance to see the final FOP data I have a very truncated version of Eileen's data, but what it captures is basically the essence of the efficacy. And we had some brief discussions about next steps in terms of what are we going to do with FOP. Um, so I'll kind of walk you through a little bit of that. So again, you know, kudos to Eileen for really contributing for doing these studies and giving us the first hint of some in vivo efficacy for us to believe in. <laughs> and so, so I mean, the goal of this study was to really test one of our lead compounds, which is M2009, which we know is very penetrant, in the FOP model. <laughs> Bearing in mind that in FOP, the mutation in AL2 is really causal, and it happens in almost over 90% of the patients. So I mean, those are the kind of animal models you like to have where there's a direct correlation between your target mutation and the actual disease phenotype. And so we saw it as a starter with the lack of you know, AL2-dependent DIPG models really sorted out. This was a good starter for us. So we had good tool compounds to really interrogate that. And um, one of the things that she measures is this, you know, what we call a heterotopic ossification, that is bone going in places where they shouldn't be. And she has a very nice model, ALTO, that docs inducible. So it's a well-known model, it's well established, and there's a lot of confidence in terms of its mechanism. And so compounds that work in it hopefully should work in the disease. We're hoping that we can make direct translation across from this FOP into DIPG. Granted, they are two different disease, okay, even though the origin is based on up to mutation. Okay, um, again, I mentioned this measurement. She does this, what we call heterotopic ossification, which is basically bone going in places where they shouldn't, like muscles and stuff becoming bone. And what's clear is like misregulation in the signaling due to this ALT mutation is what contributes to this extra, extra skeletal bone formation, as you see. And uh, for purpose of clinical features that she showed us, I mean, so it's a real autosomal dominant genetic disease. Okay, it's driven by the ALT gene. Um, some of the clinical features involves, you know, skeletal malformation. Let me just pull that up. So you could see, I mean, there's a skeleton, but now a lot of muscles and stuff start turning to bone. So it's, it's a really, really bad disease. And you could see um, it starts at childhood and it progresses as you actually get older. So it's, you know, I mean, if you come up with a therapy like this, you can start treating the kids. As soon as you detect the mutation, you start treating them for the rest of their life. So, I mean, an L2 inhibitor, if it doesn't work in the IPG, does have potential in a disease like this. Provided it's nice and safe, and that you can do it chronically for a very long period of time. So that's something to keep in mind. Matthew, could you just remind us, what's, is there a compound in the clinic now, or what's the farthest along for this indication targeting out to? I mean, uh, according to um, Eileen, it's this, what do you call it? It's this um, retinoic acid receptor compound. Pulvority. which is in the yeah. Maybe I can answer this. So yeah. there are two there are two out two kinase inhibitors currently in the clinic in phase one. Uh -huh. uh, one was the blueprint compound, which we talked about. And one is the compound from BioCrisp. Um, yeah. we're also taking saracatinib in due course. Yes. And then you've got other mechanisms of action, so there's the anti out active in antibody. Yes. And the retinoid palaveratin, okay. which is phase three, and mm -hmm. the antibody is phase two. Yep. Yep. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay. So, and so just to remind everybody in FOP, it's that ALT2 mutation. So this is a representative of the ALT2 receptor. And so the mutation is in this glycine serine-rich region. The mutation R206H, but then so that happens in over probably 90% of the patients with FOP. But they've actually found other mutations, some of them which are very similar to what we see in DIPG, like some of these G28 mutations. G28 double is one that's seen in DIPG, so they have been seen in FOP, but to a smaller degree. 
but they're more prevalent in if um in the IPG, some of these other mutations. Okay, um and just for a little bit more of a visual, so you could see where this arrow is, what tends to happen when you get <coughs> FOPs. This is supposed to be the region where muscle is, all of that starts turning into bone. So these are some of the preclinical features that you'll see in mouse that would represent what's going on in human. And then you could see you now here is a wild type animal after 14 days. You know, tissues look nice and normal. Then you see if you have the mutation, then you get all this porous material. You know, so it looks really, really different phenotypically after the mutation. Okay, so it's a well, well established model. And um, we had a study design initially, you know, quite ambitious. So we decided we wanted to see a nice dose response. So we had proposed 10, 25, 50, 100 mix per kg dose once a day. We had actually done that dose escalation pilot in the mouse and we were quite happy those doses were well tolerated. So this was the plan in the beginning. And that's the data we were hoping to see at the end of it. Um, however, unfortunately, to resourcing and stuff, um, she was only able to do one dose, which is the 100 mg per kg dose at the bottom. So we never really got a chance to see a dose response, but at least she thought it's better to go for the highest dose. If you're going to see any efficacy, it's most likely to be at the highest dose. So she did that. She had eight animals per group, and then she induces injury with cardiotoxin. That's the way you kind of initiate the disease in the model, then she typically would do histology at the end. Now for this experiment, what we ended up doing is we collected plasma and we also collected brain. We wanted to see what sort of exposure might be associated with efficacy and also wanted to check to see if the compound was actually getting into the brain in the model to give us a good sense of whether or not for the IPG we're going to get brain exposure. But bear in mind only one dose was tested here. Um, this is the model that she uses. So basically, she takes these embryonic mouse that actually have the mutation in them. And so five days before the injection, okay, she injects this cardiotoxin five microliters. And then after that, she starts dosing with compound for 14 days. And then she do all of the analysis. Okay, so one dose, 100 mix per kg once a day. Okay. <laughs> And so just to get to the to cut to the chase, the bottom line, so she did a number of animals and she was me measuring, you know, that bone deposits in different regions where they shouldn't be, that HO measurement volume. And so in summary, she found that, you know, we're getting very, very good efficacy for the 100 mg per kick dose. And on the right here, I just took one example of a control and the corresponding um, treated animal just to show you. So where this little circle is, where you get all that extra bone material deposited after injury. And you could see in the treated animal, you, do, you know, this particular one, you didn't see any bone deposit. I mean, the compound is working well. I mean, but in the, and what's also important to note is, the, you know, for this experiment, the compound was well tolerated. There was no overt signs of toxicity and she saw no body weight loss. So for me, that was huge. We're getting efficacy and, you know, we're not seeing any tox. I'm quite comforted by the fact that we'll be able to dose at those doses and be able to see efficacy in the IPG also. So this was huge for us, actually. And then these are more the individual animals. I'll just highlight them for people who might want to go back and have a second look. So the top is the control group. she will show you where you get all that extra bone deposits. And then these are some of the treated animals. That was part of the statistical summary that we just saw. Okay, and then this is just a second set. All right, so what we had decided to do is, so Eileen, she finished the experiment, she shipped brain and plasma to us, so we are currently doing the exposure, you know, studies for the, that particular experiment. And so soon as we get that data, we'll, you know, pass it on to the team. Um, the other thing we also really wanted from this experiment, as you can see from the design, was dose escalation. But that never happened. We only did one dose, so we now sat down and we had a discussion, appreciating that you know Eileen is actually stopped for resourcing. Um, so we thought, so the whole group, hello, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Is it dosing once every twenty-four hours, every twelve hours, or what? Once a day. She does once a day. I mean, I okay. think it's yeah, just once a day dosing. The issue that they said was because the mice are so young, 
and small that uh, they don't handle twice a day dosing well. That was uh, their comment. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so we have the samples, we'll get the brain and plasma exposure, we'll report that data. But one of the things we really discussed after the meeting was getting another dose so that we can get a better sense of dose escalation. So we'd like to see a lower dose with our 50 mix per kg. Um, and it looked like she said she'll be able to do that. So she's currently trying to map out the plan to be able to um, do that study for us. She hasn't commit, committed fully yet. But yeah, so the next step is uh, Friday I have a call with her and I'm just going to catch up and see how she's doing with um, availability, et cetera. Yeah. Get some feedback. Yeah. But we're hoping to get another dose done, again, with proper statistics. So we want at least eight animals per group and stuff so we'll get a better sense of whether or not the 50 meg per kick dose also works. Um, and then we had discussed a little bit for some of the backup compounds that we have coming along, if we really want our system in FOP, does she have the capacity to actually test our backups? And if not, the possibilities of looking at other CROs that might be doing it. So those are still discussions that we have ongoing. But for starters, I think we're getting nice. If we can see an FOP at 100 megs, right now we're going to try and assess a lower dose to see if we can see the sort of dose response. It's going to be very, very useful. Okay. Um, so, so that was about it for the more truncated, highlighted version of the FOP study that was done. Nobody want, if no one has any other questions. Yeah, my only comment was uh, 50 megs per kg and 100 megs per kg isn't all that different. different. And I'm just wondering how the, the predicted exposures at those two doses would be, like if they're going to be, um, if it's going to be really high at 50, mm -hmm. is it almost going to be more like a repeat of the 100? 100 megs. Is that what... Uh, you're looking for, you're looking for actually a dose which causes some effect, but not as much to get a dose response. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, we ended up picking so from the dose escalation we had, we had 10, 25, 50, and then everybody said we should go for a lower dose. So 50 was the number we landed on, but you're right, 50 and 100 may not be different. Because if you look at the, um, if you look at the early dose escalation study we had done, 100 mix we're getting about what 11,000 nanogram at 50 mix we're getting about 9,000 so mm -hmm. to your point they're not very different so we might have to go lower to really get a meaningful difference mm -hmm. in order to see it. so but the question is I mean do you want to know if 50 mix is still efficacious or you actually want to get close to a more noisy right so Those, I, I think I think the answer is right now you know we we, we picked 50 uh, mix per kg just um, we haven't we still have to finalize that Mm -hmm. And it's a very good point. Mm -hmm. We want to get some, you know, we, we had really good results here, you know, mm -hmm. and it, to the extent of being, you know, it's great, but it's too good to use as a comparison. We want to see, okay, we want to get, you know, 50% efficacy mm -hmm. so that we can compare it with others at the same level and now see, because if all the drugs come back and say 100% cure, we don't have a scalability of which one's better or selectivity. Yeah. So we want to get back so that we can have some kind of selectivity. Yeah. So you're absolutely right. It, it, you know, it's we put up like we, examples too. If yes. It, you know, given methane's comments about the concentration. It, yes. like a, I, I agree. I think, you know, this, this is a, this is a, 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 almost a placeholder saying 50 mix per kg. I yeah. think we, in a perfect world, I'd love to have gone back and got the 10, 25, 50. Yeah, the full dose is I don't expect that Eileen has the bandwidth to do that. Yeah, it's right. a short answer. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to have to make a, a smart guess. Mm -hmm. And someone smarter than me is going to have to make that final guess. Yeah. But that's is, the goal. This is, this is Al. I mean, can you guys not calculate, you know, the exposure, the concentration in the blood, you know what the IC50 is, and choose something at half max or something like that? I don't think we have the data. But. Yeah, so we're going to get the exposure numbers to see what the exposure was that associated with the efficacy in her study. So we'll get that number and we might do some of that calculation. But yeah. you've, got the, you've got the PK data from 2009 oh. in, in regular old mice, no? Yeah, so that's just routine PK. Sometimes you'll be surprised. I mean, you get PK data and then you get efficacy data. And those numbers could look different. So we really want to see what PK is associated with efficacy. I but mean, if the numbers are the same, that would be great. Ben? 
if your theory, you're going to just take a wild ass guess at a number and just choose one, wouldn't you just do the math and just choose that one? If it's, you know, there's no, there's no, if there's no rational way to decide between 10, 25, 50, wouldn't you, isn't it logical to do that? I, yeah, yeah, but that's something we could do. I mean, it's let's run it by Ahmed. Yeah, um, he he's a he's a person who's going to be picking that target. Yeah, yeah, Ahmed is going to pick it. I mean, that's first. I mean, we have our PK from those escalation. He's going to see the exposure that's associated with the efficacy, and then we can now use those two information to kind of help gauge a dose. And what's nice is it seems that you showed before it's pretty linear. Linear, yes. So uh, we're not going to get a huge, maybe not a huge surprise. Exactly. Well, you exactly. might you might want to think about seeing if you can keep it under the HERG window, if you can see efficacy without, in theory, getting a concentration where you hit the HERG. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Okay, that's good. Okay, so that's about it for presentation. I mean, at the end of it was more discussion. I mean, whether or not we want to go into some of the brainstorming we had around some of the DIPG models, or we could put those off until next time. Probably get Julia and maybe Chris Jones and those people to chime in in terms of planning for um, a DIPG efficacy study. Yeah, I, I think we should have a, a more formal discussion um, about, uh, about DIPG uh, animal model. Um, and make sure that everyone's prepared and, and has the information. I mean, it, it's it's still about two months off on our on our Gantt chart, or a little bit more maybe. Um, and and I think there's a lot of good questions about it. I mean, yeah. we, we have our we, we're getting various uh, forms of feedback about um, what kind of data we get out of it. Uh, mm -hmm. I take the view that it's going to be part of the selection process. Yes. And is it? But then again, I'm open to is it the is it the best tool that we have for for the selection process, mm -hmm. and so that's uh, that's that's where I'm at. Did you guys share? Did you guys Sorry. share the the feedback I got from my few calls earlier? I was offline for a little sec when you were talking. No, about no, we haven't. But that's a good thing. Why don't you do that now? I mean, well, I spoke to Saul Rosenberg, who's at AbV, and uh, he's a, a senior med chemist in oncology and the inventor of Venita Clax about you know, whether a DIPG model was uh, a go-no-go. -no -go. I also spoke to Stephen Fry, who is the inventor, as you know, of Ava Dart and led programs in a bunch of oncology drugs when he headed up MedChem at GSK. And I and then made a, kin a bunch of kinase inhibitors and asked him. And, he, and then I also asked Nada and uh, Michael, two clinician scientists, and Peter Dirks, who are all clinician scientists in brain cancers, as to whether a brain cancer model would be on a go, no go, given the fact that we've got such strong target validation in the genetics. And to a person, they said it was a straw man argument that would not, they felt was not required uh, if one C saw efficacy. So the just, I, and those are the only guys I've spoken to. I didn't canvas any wider, but they, they're not inexperienced dudes, right? And, and no. All of them said that, you know what, it's like a make work experiment to, in essence. Uh, anyway, so that's just, you know, I'll be um, parroting what they said when we have a formal discussion about it should definitely not slow us down. That's for sure. It's a, probably a nice yeah. to have. Um, mm -hmm. But I would, at least from what these guys are saying, from the clinical point of view, and we'll find out more of the clinical advisory board, and from the guys who've made cancer drugs view, um, they suggest it's, it's a not important. I mean, as smart as these guys are, and I, I know they're really smart, um, they're, not, they're not really the customers. I mean, the, the customers are the clinicians who are going to be actually testing it in kids. It seems like their, their, their opinions would be the ones that would hold court. Yeah, they're not a Peter Dirk or Yeah, they, yes. they, 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 yeah. They, yeah. Yes. yeah they, they do. Um, do you think Peter Dirk would be a person who would actually uh, help? Could help. Wow. He's a surgeon, sorry. But, yeah, um, Peter, so, Peter, Michael, and Nata are both MD, PhDs that treat or do surgery on these patients. And yeah. all of them said, you know, given the genetics, they would have no problem in, pres in going for it. Yeah. I mean, again, I, I think the, 
it, I think it, it also uh, matters how you ask the question. You know, I'm, I guess the, the, it's possible the way that it, the question, or they were viewing the question, again, to, to have the answer is, if we fail on a DIPG model, does that mean it's a go, no go? Right. Well, maybe not, because mm -hmm. how relevant is the animal model to, to the human, mm -hmm. the disease, how, you know, there's a whole question about, uh, uh, about the cell lines were being used, et cetera, et cetera. Does it kill the program? Mm -hmm. and, and that's a very good question, and I'm not too sure whether a regulatory or, or um, uh, the clinicians, how they would feel. That's a different conversation. I'm viewing this more as a we have x number of compounds out out there we have to get from x down to a third of x mm -hmm. and this is information that helps us weed out and think of which ones are the best no ones. that's i i push back no i don't wait this, this betting all the all the money on 2009 i don't no, i don't no, buy no. It. you could have you could have real measures like brain exposure of the compound effective concentration in the brain the efficacy on a contrived model should not be a go no go at all, and it's just clouding the issue, in my opinion. I just, I mean, we can talk about it later, but I feel quite sure. strongly about this. We spent the last twenty years talking about how animal models are crippling drug discovery, and and here we're exactly at the position where in every drug discovery program, we're talking about animal models, and we're falling back into the exact same thing that for twenty I mean years we've said shouldn't. <laughs> influence us it's remarkable we are part of the problem can i just make a comment so this is nicole hamblin from charles river so someone else who's progressed drugs into the clinic i just want to say that the other customers that we should think about are probably the regulators and you can go to get very early scientific advice on just these topics about what yeah, data they like to see and maybe that's something else we should think about because we can get valuable data from these models around dose prediction and safety thresholds if we're worried about HERG and, and I don't know if that would be something that the regulators would like to see not so much the yes. efficacy model but what else can you get from these models that help you design that clinical study and give them confidence around the safety so we could approach a regulator for you get free scientific advice and maybe that's something that would be worth considering absolutely yeah 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 mm -hmm. and I mean like I said I mean my greatest concern was a lot of the compounds I've seen evaluated in some of these patient DIPG models, even though they're not ideal, it looked like they weren't able to dose escalate. So any lack of efficacy, I feel like, was based on tox. And so now we can dose these, if we can dose these compounds at 100 mix per kick, I'm confident we're going to see efficacy in one of the DIPG models that we are doing. So, and it's a plus, it's a plus to the package. I mean, it's not a be all, you don't have to have it, but it just strengthens the package. That's the way to think of it. Bizarre. No, it strengthens and if it works. And if it doesn't work, we're going to ignore it. It is a redundant experiment. The effic I mean, potentially, I mean, you can get the, the dosing, et cetera, without the model. I, I just tell you guys, it's, 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 it's interesting to watch these discussions. <laughs> it's yeah, well, well, we'll have this again. I hasn't changed my mind about trying to select compounds. No, and that's and I the, the comment that Sue made and others. I think we agree. You know, it's a reg, I'm very curious about. Yeah, we need to get to the regulatory side too. Mm -hmm. But that's also so. To be honest, that that's uh, you know, in my view, that's a, that's also a look at the at the pre, at the preclinical studies that we have to do next. Mm -hmm. um, and the, that'd be a whole different set of all, like what do you need, et cetera. You know, how are you going to convince a regulatory body that you actually have some form of efficacy for this drug that you're going to give to, to, to young children? Um, so we have to have that conversation separately. But right now, mm -hmm. we have to figure out the best way to select the best thing we have. And this is a tool that we need, I think we should still explore. But I, okay. That's why, again, I'd rather not do it ad hoc, but have a formal meeting Good. at the yeah. right time with all the right people in. And yeah. roll uh, up your sleeves. And roll up our sleeves and sit there and, and let, let's hear it out uh, yeah. instead of hopping around. Okay. All right, any other burning issues? If not, yep, thanks for some of those lively discussions. Yeah. And, um, you know, look forward to next month's update with some other compounds. And looking forward to seeing more compounds next week. Yes. Next month. Yes, yes. All right. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for the presentations and listening in and chiming in and contributing. So, see you next month. Take care. Bye-bye.
Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.